Madonna. Yeah, only the best music here on the Gascony Show, the show for the Gascony region. I have great pleasure in telling you that with me in the studio tonight, like I mentioned earlier, is a very special person. Nigel Leaf Fielding was one of the drug dealers jailed as a result of the famous 1977 drug cartel bust in the UK called Operation Julie. Leaf's journey, written in his own words, from his early days and his first experience with LSD, to his falling from grace and a long sentence in the nick for conspiracy to, to deal LSD, has just recently been published. Leaf Fielding, welcome to the Gascony Show. Thank you, John. Thank you for coming in. First off, I'd like to say uh, that I've read your new book, To Live Outside the Law, and as I said to you earlier in the week, it is nothing short of geni genius. It is a, a riveting and, and captivating read for me, for, certainly from start to finish. Now, you start your story on March 26, 1977, when you and uh, your wife, Mary, are, are woken up in bed by police under the direction of Operation Julie. This must have been, this must have really been, you know, it must have felt like the beginning of the end for you. First of all, John, uh, thank you for such a positive statement about the book. <laughs> it's really amazing. <laughs> thank you. Indeed. Uh, yes, uh, waking up to discover I'd been captured was, well, frankly, it was one of the worst moments of my life. Uh, and then it gradually dawned on me that the life I'd been living was over uh -huh. forever. Wow. It wasn't the beginning of the end so much as the end, the end of that stage of my life. The police were there and that was it. Nabbed. Well, um, let me read to you and, and our listeners uh, what Wikipedia claims about Operation Julie. Operation Julie was a, a UK police investigation into the production of LSD by two drug rings during the mid-1970s. The operation involving 11 police forces and two and a half year, over, over two and a half year period resulted in the breakup of one of the largest LSD manufacturing operations in the world. It culminated in 1977 with enough LSD to make 6.5 million tabs, with a street value of 6.9 million pounds sterling being seized. 120 people uh, were arrested in the UK and France, and over 800,000 sterling discovered in Swiss bank accounts. It must have given you, uh, Leif, um, some kick, um, you know, some kick back then, and I'm sure it must still give you a, a thrill even today, even after having paid the price through years of prison to have been part of this uh, enormous operation. Well, John, uh, getting arrested certainly did not give me a kick, uh, <laughs> except perhaps a kick in the nuts. <laughs> but uh, looked at from Putting today's... Putting it rather succinctly. <laughs> <laughs> looked at from today's perspective, yes, it's, it's true. There is... I do... I don't know if kick's quite the right word, but uh -huh. I do appreciate, I know that I've taken part in momentous events and uh, yeah. that have a place in history, whatever strange place that is, or right. it turns out to be. That's fantastic. <laughs> of course, your, your, your story really starts with your childhood, I mean, um, from your book. It was blighted uh, by tragedy, uh, lest I say, and, and emotional neglect, right? That's right, yes. Uh, the first six years of my life were great. Uh, it's really important to get a good start, I think. It, I knew that uh, I was secure and I was loved. Uh, and then my mother died in a car crash and my father was very badly injured also. Uh, so my little sister went to live with an aunt and my brother and I were sent to boarding school. And we stayed with our grandmother in the holidays. Uh, my dad, after he recovered, he was in the army and he wasn't able to look after us and work. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that went on for... Uh, about six years, I think. And we became a family again after my dad remarried uh, in the early 60s. And you weren't, you weren't very chuffed with his new wife, were you? No, we, we weren't a, a happy family uh -huh. at all. Uh, as time went by, uh, through, through my life, I came to realize that my stepmother was a really screwed up woman. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But at the time, we just thought she was horrible. I see. Yeah. Uh, kids don't, uh, they don't weigh things up you the, don't way, know the way you can do later. Yeah. Um, but much later in life, uh, I became a step-parent myself. So now I've seen the relationship from both sides. And it, it is a difficult role to, to be a step-parent. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, it doesn't alter the fact that uh, 
My stepmother made a real mess of our family. She made your youth hell, really, did she? Or? Well, we, uh, we were away at school, my brother and I, most of the time. And Which is also a fascinating part of your book. Oh, the, well, the, yeah, the, that's, the that's another and... story. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we escaped the brunt of it. My, uh, my sister suffered uh, because she was at home. Uh -huh. she, she suffered more. Um, and also, we were older. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it wasn't, you know, going home was like going from one kind of jail, boarding school, to another kind of jail. So you were getting geared up for jail, really, at a very yeah, early stage. Yeah, lots of practice. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, were, you went to university in Reading. Your, your university days uh, there, uh, that's, that's where you first encountered LSD and, and was what transformed your life, really, wasn't it? That's right. Uh, tra transformed is, is the word. Uh -huh. uh, it was uh, in the summer of love, 1967. What, what, a be what better year, mid-60s, huh? Yes. <laughs> um, and... Uh, well, we, we, uh, there were no drugs around. I better set a bit of background. There were no drugs around in Reading at the time other than amphetamines. There were a few mods, uh, pill poppers in the town. But, mm -hmm. And uh, we understood that uh, some Jamaicans who smoked ganja. But on the campus, there, there weren't any drugs. And, uh, and then things were happening. There was uh, the hippies in San Francisco and London was starting to swing and we kept hearing rumours about drugs. We were really curious and we tried to chase the rumours down to their source and we never got anywhere. And then we noticed that the, the people upstairs were acting very strangely but they seemed to be having a great time so we thought they must be smoking that grass. <laughs> so um, so you went to check it out. We, we went upstairs <laughs> to try to score uh, a, bit of, a bit of dope. And uh, they said, no, no, we haven't got any. Uh, we've got some LSD, but that would be too strong for you. So uh -huh. without knowing what I was saying, I said, well, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> they gave me this, uh, well, they, my friend and I, they gave us two sugar cubes. Uh, and um, we gave them a Hendrix album. In, in return. In return. <laughs> and, uh, Who got the best part of that deal, I wonder? <laughs> well, uh, at the time, or immediately afterwards, there was no doubt in my mind that we had the best part of that deal, because we could still Hendrix, they played it really loud. All right, so but uh, right now, I wouldn't mind having that old Hendrix album. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> You'd give a couple of sugar lumps for it, would you? <laughs> if I still had them, yes. <laughs> And what age were you, if you don't mind me asking? What age no, were you? I, when was, you uh, I was 18. You were 18. Was, that was my first drug experience. And uh -huh. it, in one day, it totally transformed It blew my your life. mind completely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Forever. Forever. Yeah, my, I was on a different course from that day. Isn't that amazing? How Extraordinary, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, then, then came uh, what, by all accounts, was your resolute uh, decision to, to drop out in the late 60s, which meant um, a lot of travel for you. And then, of course, ultimately, this lifestyle uh, led to your involvement with your, your, for want of a better word, co-conspirators and, and your creation of the LSD dis distribution network. Well, John, you covered an awful lot of ground with yeah. just a few words <laughs> there. That, uh, it's just you could tell it in my homework. Yes, yes, I, I dropped out and joined the hippies. That was uh -huh, in, uh -huh. in one day. Uh, yeah, and you travelled the... Yes, I quit university. You quit, you tr literally dropped out of that as well. Yes, and, I did. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. And we, uh, my pal and I, uh, we asked the people upstairs, you know, wh where, can we get, where can we get some more of this? You know, everyone should try this. And we got hold of a bottle and started handing it out to our friends. All right, and that was the beginning of the... That, that was the beginning, The, the yeah. distribution network as we, as we know it. And then... Um, Soon after that, I, I started traveling. That's uh -huh, right. Uh -huh. And, um, and that, that, was the, that was a big change in your life. Nothing was the same after that. Um, you say it hashed your life. That's one of the words I see you, you've used here. Uh, it, it was a hash of your life? Oh, well, that was, that was my dad's opinion. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> you, weren't, you didn't have the short, short back and size haircut and wearing a uniform there. <laughs> no, no. He, uh, I mean, he thought I'd gone... Totally to pot. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> now the world was a, a complete. Of course, it was. A, let's put it in perspective for our listeners here. The world was a very different place back then. Yeah, it you, certainly was. You yeah. travelled, yeah. You travelled all over Europe and, and hung out in places like Turkey, Mor and places you mightn't hang out today as a white man, I suppose, in, in Turkey, Morocco, and the Far East. And 
And it was a, a, well, it was a time when people didn't care very much about crime or lock their cars or, or even their houses and mass media wasn't really there yet. And uh, So you schmoozed around the world with virtually no money, selling drugs to stay alive. Uh, that must have been an incredible time. It was uh, an extraordinary time. You've, uh, you, you've cut it a bit short, really. To start with, uh, uh, it was much more innocent, the, the beginning of my travels. The first travel I went on my own and uh, actually had three pounds, ten shillings when I landed in France. And well, it just was in, to put that in perspective, in today's money, that would be about... Uh... Um, I don't know, maybe 20 quid or something. Oh, I see. <laughs> Uh, well, in, to put it in perspective, the, the fare was two pounds ten shillings, the cross-channel fare, and I hadn't right. bought a return ticket. So <laughs> if I kept two pounds ten shillings for the return, I had a quid to spend. Uh -huh. And I ran out of money very quickly. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I discovered the extraordinary generosity of, of people. Um, Amazing, really, and it seemed like the poorer the people, the more generous they were, the more prepared to share the little they had with someone who'd wandered into their lives and they'd never see again. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. The poorer, the more generous. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. I think most people are, most people are generous and, unless they've got great wealth to protect, and then it's a different story. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, um... You, you maintain that even, even though LSD became an illegal substance, you never meant any harm to anyone when you manufactured it and, and sold it. In, in fact, at one stage, uh, I read, you firmly believed that LSD would save the world. Uh, so really, you were you know, I idealistic, a, a dope smoker, a guy who wanted to turn the rest of the world on. Do you, do you still believe this? Well, um, yeah, just to start with the beginning of your question, uh, Yes, I absolutely believe that uh, from that first trip. I was on a mission. Uh, as I told you, we, we got hold of a, a bottle of acid and uh -huh. we started to turn our friends on. I wanted to turn the whole world on. <laughs> I wanted to bring us back from the brink of nuclear war because this was the shadow that hung over our society in those days. Oh, of course, it, yeah. was, it was a very open and innocent society. There weren't crime waves and things, but we had the bomb. We lived with the threat of the bomb and uh, annihilation. And I thought, I mean, acid had had such an incredible effect on me. I thought, this, if we can get this to everybody, this will, this will transform the world. We'll realize that fundamentally we're all the same. We don't have to fight. We don't have to blow each other to pieces. So I was on a mission. Fantastic. <laughs> but um, yeah, you, you ended by saying, do I still... Do I still believe mm, this? Well, this it's, point, yeah. it's now 44 years after my first trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, do I still believe that uh, LSD can save the world? Well, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, of course I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I was you can naive. tell me later whether you really do or not. <laughs> I was naive to think that sure. any pill could solve all humanity's problems. But remember, I was only 18. Yeah. I was naive. And, and on your first trip. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. why, why don't we stop there for a little song, and we'll come by, right back, uh, folks, to, to our interview here with uh, the very interesting, very entertaining Lee Fielding. So here we have Rihanna, California, King Bed. Hi. So only the best music here on the Gascony Show. And I'm speaking here tonight with my guest, Lee Fielding. Leaf was uh, one of the drug dealers jailed uh, as a result of the famous 1977 drug cartel bust in the UK called Operation Julie. Now, Leaf, uh, for a long time you thought that uh, if everybody dropped acid, all the bad stuff in the world would stop. And I remember on, on page uh, 267 of your book, you state that, um, and I quote, uh, and this is the crux. The chemicals can let you see the possibilities, but it's up to you to realize them. Now, do you still believe that people should take LSD to expand their consciousness, if, you know, if only for, for a while, so as to know what it is they can do, in fact, or what they can realize? Well, uh, I no longer think that it's for me to recommend to people what they should do. Mm -hmm. What I do think uh, is that we should all be free to do what we want, oh, right. provided, of course, that we don't hurt anyone in the process. I share that view. I'm a bit of a libertarian myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, do what we want and be prepared to accept the consequences of our actions. 
Very good, very good. Uh, and that, I think that's a great lesson for our listeners. Do what you want, folks, so long as you're uh, prepared to take the consequences. Now, one comment, as I, as I researched a little bit before, uh, before this uh, interview, one comment that I saw on the BBC website was uh, from a chap called Peter Sim. And he said, idealists, this is his quote, um, this is what he said about you guys, idealists wanting to improve society and making millions poured into offshore bank accounts. Anyone else see a slight contradiction? These guys weren't some old lady growing a bit of cannabis to help her arthritis pains. Unquote. After having uh, lived below the breadline leaf for most of your life, uh, surely the money uh, must have been a big attraction. Did you did you make a lot of money from LSD, M more than say from your interest in your fledging fledgling uh, Reading Whole Foods? Well, um, first of all, the the BBC comment is is a fair enough observation. There is uh, a contradiction, uh -huh. but uh, I think it's worth making a couple of points. Our conspiracy ran uh, for around eight years and a lot can happen in eight years and and a lot did mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning there was no question that we were idealists we wanted to turn the world on uh, we believed in what we were doing all of us and we began in a very small way and we were quite disorganized and very light-hearted we were in a way we were thumbing our nose at society or at the authorities yeah, because uh, yeah. we're still we're still young. I'm not I'm not a teenager anymore at this point, but in my early twenties. Uh -huh. And um, as time went on, uh, the operation grew in size, and inevitably we were affected by the stress of having an illegal life because mm. that's what it amounted to. You can't be unaffected by your lifestyle. You do what you want, and you take the consequences. And one of the consequences was. Uh, paranoia. It became part of our lives. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the organization just kept getting bigger and bigger. More and more people wanted the, the stuff that we were making. Uh, we're, we're, uh, I would quickly say that our LSD was the purest LSD that had ever been made <laughs> anywhere in the world, purer than the Sandos Laboratories, right. where, where Hoffman first synthesized LSD in uh, 1938. <laughs> That's your claim to fame. <laughs> Pure uh, stuff. Not, not mine. I wasn't the chemist, but I uh -huh. have to say the, the was chemist good. was a, a genius. This, uh -huh. this stuff was unbelievably, uh -huh. unbelievably pure. Sorry, I got a bit off the... Uh, no, that's all right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, with, with the paranoia and the wear and tear, I suppose that I came to feel that the money I was making uh, was justified by, by the risks I was running. Mm -hmm. That This is how I thought of it at the time. I was... Uh, I was trying to turn people on, and as a result of that, I could get locked up. And so it was fair enough to, uh, to make some money out of it. So this it wasn't this is a long way away from the, the innocent way that we started. It wasn't the opposite, then, that you were taking these risks so as to make the money, as Peter Sim would have you? No. Uh, um, yeah. Personally, I didn't, I didn't make a lot of money from it, and money was never my principal motivation. But mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. true that the, the people at the top of the organization especially in the last year when things just got massive, they, uh, they were making money. The money just kept rolling in, and uh, Swiss bank accounts were opened and money was put in them, but not millions. There was never, never even one million in all the Swiss bank accounts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't get rich from my acid activities. I've worked it out later. Uh, my brother is an army officer, mm -hmm. and I... Uh, talking to him and I worked out that he made more money as an army officer than I made as an acid dealer. We have, we have, to, we have to talk to your politicians though, they're paying those army officers far too much. <laughs> no, no, the army aren't incredibly well paid. I, I was risking my liberty, uh, but my brother was prepared, prepared to risk his life. Uh -huh. Yes, I see what you mean. <laughs> Put me in perspective. <laughs> yeah. now, now your book, let's get to your book. Your book has been described as a fascinating record of a, of a precious distant time and Operation Julie seems to have uh, represented the final death throes of the 90, 1960s counterculture conclusively shattering the idealism with which you and, and many others uh, once viewed the drug scene was this the end of the 60s love and drugs the true hippie movement uh, and the beginning of a, a more harsh more brutal era for the narcotics uh, on the world would you say Leaf? Uh, I think it probably was. A lot of people have said this to me, but uh, 
you must remember that I was in prison and I was in prison for a long time and so in no position to monitor what was happening in, in the counterculture. Uh -huh. um, but certainly when I came out, uh, I came out into a vastly changed world. I can imagine, It was a different yeah. place. Yeah. Gone were the hippie days, huh? Gone were the hippie days. It was, it was Thatcherism. It was business then. Business, business. Even in the drug scene. <laughs> oh, yeah. Apparently yeah. it was. Now, a lot of, uh, speaking of your time in prison, a lot of uh, prison time was dished out to all of the 15 defendants in the Operation Julie trial. Some mm -hmm. 120 years in total. How many, how many years did you get and how many did, did you serve? I got uh, eight years, and I served five, just under five. It wasn't too bad, really. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, try it, John, and, no. uh, and tell me if no, you... No, I've read uh, your descriptions of it in your book, and I don't think I, will, I, don't think I want to go there. It's quite a long time. You, you know, if you look back and you think, gosh, that's five years ago, it doesn't seem like anything. Yeah. But if you think that you're going to prison now, and you won't be out until 2016... Oh, yeah. Ouch. It's a long time. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. Now, you write about prison life quite extensively, uh, as we were saying, in your, in your book. Can you tell us about a few of the more interesting incidents for our listeners here on the radio? Well, um, you, you have a different perspective on life uh, if you've got to spend a long time in prison. Y you learn to make long-term plans for a start. You mm -hmm. haven't got much to do, um, but you can sit in your cell and plan. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I did. Uh, there was one job in the NIC that I really wanted. I saw that right from the start. And, uh, and I got that job, but it took me three years. Three, three years, years of angling. You, you were almost parolable myself. at that stage, no? Uh, I would have been parolable, but at that point I had already had my first parole refusal. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, three years for a job. So the job I wanted uh, was to be a gardener. Mm -hmm. And it was the only job where you could be outside all day. And oh, there were only three gardeners in a, a prison population of, I'm not sure, actually, seven or eight hundred, uh -huh. something like that. Right. Only three gardeners. <laughs> um, but it was, it was a wonderful job. I was, I was outside. Uh, and most, most days the, there was a screw in charge of the, the garden party. And most days he took some of the short-termers outside 